that rats have been shown to have metacognition. That is, they're, they know what they know, and they know what they don't know. A very clever study designed to do that, but I won't use up much time on that. A little bit about emotions. Uh, hands up if you have a companion animal, if you've lived with cats or dogs. Yeah, who would have guessed there'd be so many in this group? <laughs> Yeah, we don't need much convincing if we, uh, well, actually, I want to put hands up. Hands up if you think that cats and dogs are not emotional. Yeah, don't get many hands for that. Occasionally, a, a hand sort of goes shyly up. But uh, yeah, if you've lived with them, you, you know they're emotional. In fact, it's a little bit sobering. They can be so intensely emotional. I have two cats. I live with, well, they live with me. I live with them. Um, following a visit to the vet, one of my cats, the male, Micah, was so traumatized emotionally that he went on a hunger strike and he didn't come downstairs for 40 hours to get food. He was not the one who'd been to the vet, it was actually <laughs> Megan. So through a sort of um, osmosis, if you like, an emotional osmosis, uh, he was more freaked out than her. Actually, you know, I have thought about that as an ethologist and I have to say it kind of makes sense because there, he'd been to the vet before, he knew the smells, it was a bad experience for him, it is particularly for cats, very sensitive animals, uh, but he, he hadn't actually had the contact, it was an eerie thing, his best friend came back with all this aura of vet, that he smells, and you know what, a little bit later he went and uh, she was a little more flipped than he was, so there's an interesting phenomenon going there. Then, one of the reasons why science has been so reluctant to study animal emotions until recently, and I'm about to give you a couple of examples, is that emotions are private experiences. It's difficult to know what animals are feeling. But here's a double standard. Ultimately, our, all of our experiences are private. I, we can empathically say, I feel your pain, um, but you're not literally feeling the pain of the other individual. The feelings are private. We do have this benefit of a, a spoken language. We can convey specific information, but ultimately, solipsism is logically incontrovertible. We're going on trust that the other feels like us. Should we do that? Absolutely. We're correct in assuming we feel emotions, uh, but because it's harder to tell with other animals, we tend, science at least, has tended to give the benefit to the doubt rather than the benefit of doubt to the animals. So who knows what these seals are feeling, but I've spoken to the photographer who took the picture uh, he says they were frolicking. Sometimes it got a little bit, bit rough, but these are seals with thick skin, and literally and metaphorically probably. And uh, it did look, the, the whole tenor of the interaction looked, it's a male and female, by the way, looked like courtship, looked like a sort of a sexual type of thing. Um, can seals feel love? You'd want to know a little bit more about their reproductive biology, perhaps, before making conclusions about that. But certainly animals appear to be emotional. Does science support that they're emotional? A long-term study of baboons suggests that, that, well, reinforces the assumption that we probably should all make that, that they are emotional. There's a very interesting parallel between the emotional response and the, physi the physiological and behavioral emotional response of a ma mother baboon who loses a, an infant um, in comparison to a, a woman who loses an infant. We know it's a terrible tragedy. Is it a tragedy for them? Uh, well, mother baboons show a hormonal change in glucocorticoid hormones in their bloodstream. It goes up for a month or more and then subsides. It's a, it's a pattern very close to what happens with women. Same, same hormone pattern, same sort of time, time track. And behaviorally, we rally around, we offer moral support, we send flowers, we make soup for our neighbors sort of thing. I don't think baboons make soup or send flowers as far as I'm aware, uh, but they do um, expand their social networks by grooming a lot more. A, a female baboon who's lost a young will groom significantly more with other baboons, soliciting grooming and giving grooming, expanding her social networks during the month of that uh, time when the f emotions are probably particularly raw. Caged birds become pessimistic. I'm not gonna describe the study. Uh, I'm glad I wasn't a starling in the study, although I'll tell you they did release them after the study was over, which is unusual. Usually scientific papers don't even mention the fate of the animals, and usually the fate is not to be released back into the wild. Um, but birds uh, who live in a big, rich environment, albeit captive, are much more open to new things, trying new things, than birds who've been kept in a very small environment. The worst situation for these birds was to go from big aviary into tiny cage. That was the most pessimistic outcome. What about awareness? Awareness is about taking interest in your life, taking interest in your surroundings, being curious, taking it in and responding. And animals clearly do that. I love this photo by a friend of mine who lives in Northern England, his dog Barney, uh, touching uh, noses with this cow. 
Sometimes scientists do kind of weird, almost silly things to study animal phenomena. And by the way, I just want to reiterate, if I didn't make it clear, scientists, science was not asking questions about intelligence and emotions, not the sort of questions that they are today during most of the 20th century. So it's a very exciting time to be an ethologist. In this particular study, uh, they wanted to see what sort of, are elephants keeping mental tabs on other elephants? And this is something that's kind of assumed and kind of understood and, and thought that they do. These are long-lived, large-brained animals. They do have their legendary memories. So one way to test it was what they did was they waited till elephants were moving from A to B. Let's say A is over here and B is over here. So we're moving this way. And elephants who encounter fresh urine that was deposited by an elephant in the group and dug up and redeposited. If it's urine, fresh urine from elephants who are walking ahead of them, the elephants don't take much notice. I mean, they do check it out. They're always keeping tabs that way, or they appear to be. Um, however, if they encounter fresh urine from elephants who, uh, that's been dug up from elephants behind them and quickly surreptitiously put by the scientists in front of the walking elephants, they take much more notice. They, they, uh, they twist their trunks more. Uh, they seem to be surprised, and that's, what the, that's the term the scientists uh, use. And if you think about it, it, it makes sense. It, it doesn't make sense to find fresh urine from an elephant who you know is walking behind you. So that's a clever little way to show that elephants appear to be keeping mental tabs. And it's thought they keep tabs on, on 30 or so other members. They live in large matriarchal herds, so we shouldn't perhaps be too surprised about that, but it's nice that scientists is ask, are asking these questions and giving supporting evidence. The mirror self-recognition test is thought to be the holy grail of, of self-recognition in animals. Animals who fail this test, it doesn't mean they don't, don't recognize themselves or have a sense of self, but animals who pass this test, uh, it's thought that they do have self-awareness. And um, the way the test works is that if this is a mirror, uh, I have a spot put on some part of my body where I can't see my forehead until I see the mirror. And if I see my reflection in the mirror and I immediately move to try and touch the dot, you know, look at it, uh, then it suggests that I, I'm aware that what I'm seeing in that image is myself. If I go behind and, you know, or make threat displays or whatever, that suggested that maybe the individual isn't recognizing it as oneself. Until 2008, uh, great apes, elephants, and dolphins had been shown to uh, the only species that had passed this mirror self-recognition test. And then some, a team in Germany uh, tested magpies. And you can see the yellow dot on this magpie. This magpie, on seeing him or herself in the mirror, immediately began to try and remove the yellow dot. Once again, you can go on YouTube and watch it. If it was a black dot, which is the control, the, the bird ignored it, didn't notice it. It's camouflaged against the black bib. And by the way, these are just a few snapshot examples of many, many other examples of these sorts of phenomena. Communication is a nice window into the inner lives of animals. Let's talk about another rodent, the prairie dog, an animal who has the unfortunate um, uh, lot to have many natural enemies. And perhaps that's why prairie dogs have evolved a sophisticated alarm calling system. They're not the only ones, a number of other animals do too. Chickens have a very sophisticated alarm call system. Prairie dogs have different calls for aerial predators, um, coyotes, domestic dogs, different response to each. Domestic dogs are a little slower and more predictable and coyotes are a little wilier and know how to catch ground, uh, prairie dogs. So there's different call, different response. Uh, humans, they also modify their calls for different uh, aspects. It's not fully understood why, but they, with modifiers, their vocabulary gets up to over 100. Uh, that size, shape, color, and if a human is carrying a gun, they modify the call. Now these, these are animals whose populations, historic populations have declined 98% through habitat loss and persecution. So perhaps not too surprising, they're very sensitive to guns and they, they quickly modify calls to designate that. I don't think there are any dolphins who call each other Jessica or Trevor, but they do have what's called uh, signatures, signature whistles. They have these high-pitched ultrasonic sounds and they, not only do they have their own signature, but they use the signature of other individuals to refer to them. So it's sort of like name calling, it's labeling. It's a very interesting phenomenon. It's also been shown in spectacled parrotlets. Now, that's pretty esoteric. If spect spectacled parrotlets use labels for individuals, then probably a lot of parrots do, I would suspect. They call the, mo the mother bird or the, or the father, they help with the nest, calls in the young uh, using different calls, and by playback experiments, scientists can show that they actually are labeling other individuals. 
I write and talk a lot about pleasure because it's something that's been neglected by science. There's at least 23 scholarly journals with the word pain in the title, and I bet you can guess how many scholarly journals there are with the word pleasure in the title. Zippo, not a single one. There was a journal called the Journal of Happiness Studies. It's defunct. I don't know why we're not more interested in the study of positive feelings. Well, Meg Almert is making great contributions to that. Uh, in the previous uh, presentation. So I, I think there is a, a sign of this is going to change. I do hope so. But it's important to recognize that sentience is not just about uh, pain, it's also about pleasure. And often we look at nature and we think, oh, it's aggressive. These two squirrels are actually playing. They're sort of a play chase. And uh, you'll see that a lot. And one of the cues to that is that they would often change direction and the one being chased would become the chaser. They're also young, particular young ones, I think in this case. And young tend to be more playful. Play has good adaptive benefits, building physical strength, uh, learning the ropes of social behavior, that sort of thing. But as far as I know, animals don't study up on Darwinian fitness and natural selection. Uh, they play for the same reason we do. It's fun. It feels good. It's very motivating. And to talk about pleasure, I, I love the word coevolution, and I always mention that. Coevolution is a wonderful synergistic aspect of nature. It's how different organisms, sometimes disparate organisms, evolve together to um, benefit, to be adaptive. And fruit is a beautiful example, and it's mediated by pleasure. Fruit is a, is a mechanism that plants used, use, and I don't want to imply uh, a, a consciousness to plants. We could discuss that. It's a whole separate issue. Uh, used to get their seeds from A to B. Some plants use the wind, some plants use seeds that stick to animal fur or our clothing, and we drop them off later, and we think, oh, well, you tried to fool me, but actually we've just done exactly what the plant wanted us to do. We've moved the seed away from the parent plant where it won't compete with the parent for light, nutrients, water, and other things like that. So that's sort of the biological mechanism for seeds. Well, fruit is another mode of getting seeds away. How does it work? Well, of course, it works by using a mobile organism, an animal. So fruit are a beautiful uh, example of a co-evolutionary relationship between plants and animals, and it's mediated by pleasure. Bright colors, nice smells, um, delicious taste, and a big nutritional reward. And uh, in return for that, the animal carries it away or eats it on the spot and drops it out later with a nice convenient package of fertilizer. <laughs> well, um, it's also kind of a sex-related thing because it's to do with reproduction from the plant's perspective. And it wouldn't do to mention uh, pleasure in animals without mentioning sex. So I've mentioned it. I'm going to move on. I think, I don't know if there's any kids here, but I get pretty graphic on the subject of sex in my book, Pleasurable Kingdom, but I, I, don't, I don't have time to go into it here. But suffice it to say, there's a lot, there's a lot of pleasure built into animal sex. Um, some of you might not need convincing of that. But. <laughs> Touch is a very, very, it's the most physical of all these senses. And um, animals share touch a lot. This has been already touched on by er, an earlier speaker. And yes, indeed, their hormones change. Pleasure hormones are released that mirror the same kind of brain activity and hormonal activity that we have when we're massaged. Um, and uh, many monkeys will spend 20% of their waking time grooming each other. We already mentioned how it's very important in therapy for baboons. Uh, 